Hi, I'm Jeffrey, and welcome back to Night Falls. Join me around the campfire at the foot of these mystical falls for a podcast of bedtime stories designed to help you sleep. Each week, we'll begin with a brief meditation before settling into our story for the evening. And don't worry if you fall asleep before the end. I want you to drift off whenever you're ready. Tonight, join me beside the campfire and let me tell you a tale I once heard. This is the story of a young boy named David who, heeding the call of the bluebird, goes in search of a mystical garden hidden at the heart of the forest near his home. In many ways, David's story is not dissimilar to my own. Sometimes, life can feel like it's already laid out for us and our future is set in stone. But just as I once learned, we can indeed carve out our own path through the world. Before we set off and begin to follow the twists and turns of David's tale, before we mark the winding path he cuts through the forest towards the hidden garden. Why not take a moment to yourself to wind down from the day? When you're ready, come to a comfortable position and take a moment to simply be. All there is for you to do is lie there relaxing as your breath drifts ever so easily in through your nose and out through your mouth. As your mind and body begin to relax, feel your breath deepening, filling your abdomen and opening out your chest. There's a sense of heaviness about your body and the need for sleep weighs upon you like thick blankets might. That heaviness can be of comfort to you. Welcome it into your body with a deep breath in. As you exhale, Release any tension lingering in your muscles and give yourself over to the weight of exhaustion. Your muscles are loose and languid. Your mind is ready and deserving of a restful night's sleep. Drawing in another deep breath, welcome calmness, stillness and peace into your body. Sighing out in relief, Let go of any energy that no longer serves you. Now, if you're ready, David's adventure can begin. David was the son of an honest woodcutter. He lived with his father in a little cottage on the border of the woodlands, away Away as far as the eye could see stretched great tree-covered hills and mountains. This vast area was called, by the people of the country, the Dark Forest. Some feared the mysteries of this unknown and unexplored region, but David, ever since he could remember, had always had a friendly feeling for the rough, hard bark of a pine or oak tree, and the fringed softness of the paper birch had been a delight to him ever since the day he first noticed its ragged beauty, a late summer afternoon on which, as he returned to his father's cottage, the setting sun touched the whiteness of the tree trunk beneath the cool green of its shining leaves. Some day I shall go far into the forest, he would say to himself. Who knows what treasures I may find? David grew fast and was strong, for his life in the woodlands was one to make any boy well and happy. He learned his father's trade, and in a short time, although he was not nearly full grown, he could wield an axe as well as many a grown man. In fact, he could put some men to shame, for his skill was far greater than that of the average boy of his age. 
One day, while walking along a narrow path used by the woodcutters, he met an old, old woman. Her dress was brown and made of a coarse homespun. A large basket strapped to her back was filled with pieces of firewood which she had been gathering. When she saw David, she called to him, and as he approached her, he noticed how beautiful she was. For, although her clothes were ragged, that mattered little. Her face seemed more kind and beautiful than any he had ever seen. Her hair, one lock had fallen from beneath the brown cap that she wore, was white as driven snow. Her eyes were the soft colour of oak leaves in winter, and so filled with gentleness that David could only stand and look at her. Can you tell me, she asked in a voice that sounded like a breath of wind stirring through the pine needles, can you tell me where I can find a bit of water? I've been all day in the woods and have found no spring or brook, and I am thirsty, so thirsty, for a drink of pure, cool mountain water. Yes, cried David, there is a beautiful spring not far from here. I will get some of the water for you. Rest here in the shade till I return. It will take me but a few moments. As he spoke, he lifted her basket, that she might the more easily slip her arms through the leather straps that served to hold it in place upon her back. She swung her clumsy burden to the ground and thanked him, and as soon as he saw her comfortably seated on a bed of moss beneath a sheltering tree, he hastened on his way towards the spring. As he walked along, he looked for a birch tree. He wanted some of its white bark to make a cup in which to carry the water. Soon he came to a beautiful great tree. Cutting a clean wide strip of bark, he shaped it into a bowl-like receptacle. Next, he pinned the edges together with twigs, so whittled to a point that they would pierce the bark and hold it in place. Then, hastening to the spring, he filled the birchen cup to overflowing with the clear, cool, crystal water. In a few moments, he stood before the old woman again and handed her the dripping cup. She took it, drank deeply, and was refreshed. David gazed upon her. There was something about her that he could not explain, nor could he explain to himself his strange longing to talk to her. She looked up at him and smiled. Then she motioned to him to sit down on the moss beside her. David did so. Do you live in these woods? he asked timidly. Do not remember ever having seen you before. No, answered the old woman. My house is a long, long way from here, yet not so very far away either, if only one is wise enough to follow the trail and not seek any shortcuts. Does the trail we are on lead to your home? asked David pointing to the wood path that stretched away before them, seeming to lose itself far in the distance. Yes and no, answered the old woman. It leads you there if you know how to follow it, but there are many turnings, and some of them will lead you right, and some of them will lead you wrong. It is not always easy to know which one to take, and if you choose the wrong one, it will lead you far astray. Dear me, said David, it is too bad the way is not more clearly marked. It never is, said the old woman, and it never can be. For each year the new leaves grow up to cover the old trail, 
and each year a new trail has to be found. In fact, each one has to make his own trail, even when he seems to be following another's and deceives himself into thinking that he is doing so. It is the law of the forest. For any trail other than the one we make ourselves may lead us where we do not desire to go. And all at once we find ourselves deep in the woods, the path lost, and we ourselves lost. No, we have to know where we are going and why we are going there. Then, when we know thus much for sure, there is always some sign to follow that will prevent us from losing the way. So you see, although I may start out on this path, that does not mean I shall follow it all the way. It depends upon the way the bird flies. What bird? asked David. The bluebird, answered the old woman. There are no bluebirds in these woodlands, said David. I have lived here all my life and have never seen one. There are yellow birds and red birds, brown birds and green birds, white birds and black birds, but I have never seen a blue bird. I did not know there was one of that colour. Well, said the old woman, perhaps some day you will see a blue bird. When you do, let me give you just this word of advice. Follow it. No matter where you are walking, no matter how smooth and beautiful your path may be, no matter through what regions the bird may lead you, follow it. Follow it little boy, for it will guide you there. Where? asked David. To the tree, answered the old woman. What tree? asked David. To the tree in the midst of the garden, the garden in the depths of the forest, the forest beyond the woodlands. Is your home there? asked David. Not a very great way from it, said the old woman. You will see a bluebird some day, little boy. I am sure of that. I am glad that I met you. Thank you for bringing me the cool, refreshing water. Now I must go on my way, since I have told you about the bluebird. Remember, David, seek for it and follow it. You will know what it really means only when you have reached the end of the trail. Now I must be off. Here, said David, take this birch cup. You may grow thirsty again before you reach home. And if you come to a brook or spring, you will be glad to have this with you. Thank you, boy, smiled the old woman. I am sure you will see the bluebird some day, for you have the seeing light in your eye. But don't forget to look for it. She turned and walked slowly down the wooded path. David returned to his father's home. For many, many days, the memory of the old woman remained with him. Indeed, he never really forgot her, though a very long time passed and strange things happened before he saw her again that sometimes made his memory grow dim. One day, it must have been several months after this meeting in the woods, David had been felling trees and gathering wood, for this was his daily task. Suddenly, a bird's clear, glad song broke upon the calm of the noontime air. It was unusual to hear any bird's song at that hour, but to this fact David gave no thought. 
for the clear, rich sweetness of the notes held him spellbound. He paused, resting his axe upon the ground, his head thrown back, listening. He closed his eyes, for the beauty of the music was such that he desired to think only of it and to shut out all other thoughts from his mind. A deep silence fell upon the woodlands. Then, suddenly, but as gently as a breeze stirring the petals of a rose, the song came again. Clear, sweet notes that thrilled through David's heart. All at once, as the music faded again, a bird darted from the topmost branch of a neighbouring birch tree. The sunlight played upon its wings and breast, and the heavenly beauty of the little creature dazzled David's eyes as he caught a glimpse of it before it was lost in the deep shadows of the pine-clad hillside. But in that fleeting moment he saw the colour of the bird. It was blue, the deep celestial blue of the cloudless sky. In an instant, there appeared to David, as if in a vision, the moss-covered seat and the beautiful little old woman of so many months ago. Again, he seemed to hear the words, When you see the bird, little boy, follow it. Quick as thought, David said to himself, That is the blue bird. I will follow it. He started off in the direction in which the bird had flown. He ran to the dark cedar grove toward which the blue bird had disappeared. There he hurried from tree to tree, seeking in the thick foliage the brightly iridescent gleam of the beautiful little creature's feathers. But no sign of it could David find. After searching and searching, he sat down, quite discouraged. Suddenly, he heard again the clear liquid notes of the song. Springing to his feet, he looked in the direction of the bird's music. And, sure enough, there was the exquisite creature resting on a twig just above his head. This time he had a fine chance to study it carefully, to note the markings on its wings, head and breast, and after this never forgot how the bluebird looked. No, he remembered every detail through all the long years to come. Its back and wings were of the colour that we sometimes see reflected in the surface of the ocean or of a lake or river, the wonderful deep blue of a serene sky. Its breast was like the shade of the sky on a soft summer day when great white clouds are floating about and the faint haze rests over all the earth. Its head was of the same rich, deep tone as the wings and back, and its throat was of that softer blue of the breast. When the bird flew, it seemed as if a line of gold encircled it, for the wings and tail were tipped and outlined with a golden yellow band. When one saw it darting through the sunlight, one could not but think of a bit of the sky itself outlined by a golden sunbeam. Its song was like the music of a rushing mountain brook in early springtime. Having once seen and heard this little songster, David had no other desire than to follow it wherever its flight might lead. The bird flew 
and David followed. It took no long flight, but went from tree to tree. It was as if it understood that David wished to follow, for always, before flying farther, it waited till the boy had come to the foot of the tree on which it rested. Such a journey he made, for in a short time the bird had left the woodland trail and was flying cross-country. There was no path to make David's progress less difficult. Soon he was climbing a steep mountainside. Then he descended a deep valley over steep and slippery cliffs. Once he became so entangled in briars that he was almost on the point of exhaustion. But he pushed bravely on, and in a little while he stood free from the vexing briars in an open meadow by the edge of a sparkling lake upon the surface of which bloomed white water lilies. Behind him rose the mountain over which he had journeyed and the steep, high ridges down which he had slipped and fallen. Their sheer damp walls shone now as the sunlight played upon them. It was no easy path that he had walked and as he looked back upon it He half wondered how he had been able to accomplish it all in safety. Now his way was very different. He found himself on a well-marked trail, following the edge of the lake through a beautiful pine forest. The trees had scattered their brown leaves upon the ground, and it was very soft under his sore and tired feet bird flew before him, leading him on step by step, till at last he came out of the pine forest at the head of the lake. He paused for a moment to look across the smooth surface of the water that stretched away before him. There, beyond its farthest boundary, rose the mountain, and beyond that he knew lay his home. Suddenly, the bird sang. David listened. Again, there filled his heart that same mysterious desire to follow wherever the bird might lead him. Nothing else in the world seemed to him to matter half so much. The bird flew on. Now they were in a region of white birch trees and low-growing bushes, and the ground all about was covered with a carpet of tiny purple flowers with bright yellow centres. In the distance, David saw a large tree. It was greater than any other tree which grew thereabout, and its broad spreading branches cast a cool shade. Its huge trunk, roughened and scarred by time, looked as old as the mountain itself. The bird flew toward it, David still following, and all at once it darted into a hole in the tree trunk, more than a tall man's height from the ground, and disappeared from sight. David ran to the foot of the tree and fastened the head of his axe in the hole, which he could just reach by standing on tiptoe. Then, using the handle of his axe to help him, he pulled himself up until he was able to look in. Such a sight as met his eyes. Instead of being dark and black, as were most holes of its kind into which David had ever looked, this opening seemed filled with light. It gave him the same feeling of wonder that comes over one when first one looks at the moon through a telescope. 
he saw a blaze of golden light, and within the light lay a world that seemed to him like fairyland itself. He gazed and gazed, clinging to the axe handle, digging his toes into the rough bark, lest he fall to the ground and so see no more. At last, unable to hold on any longer, he was obliged to let go and drop to the ground. Somehow, his axe became dislodged from the hole, and try as he might, he could not fasten it in again. He sat down at the foot of the tree, for he was very tired, and in a few moments he had fallen fast asleep. He had no idea how long he had slept or what awakened him, but when he finally opened his eyes, the sun was low in the western sky. His first thought was of the bluebird. What had happened to it? Had it flown away and left David there? Had he really lost the bird after all this long adventure of following it faithfully? Perhaps it was waiting for him somewhere near. Perhaps if he listened, he should hear the song again. He waited. The sun sank lower and lower, but no bird's song came to his listening ear. At last, the sun almost touched the horizon. I must look for the bird, cried David. Perhaps it is waiting for me to find it. He jumped up and searched all about in the branches of the great tree. But no trace could he find of this little winged guide. Suddenly, he noticed what he had never seen before. The bark on one side of the tree was rolled back, bearing the smooth wood underneath. However this had happened, it must have happened a long, long time ago, for the surface was weathered and stained the colour of the rough bark itself. In the middle of this smooth grey surface, he noticed a curious little knob, not unlike the handle on a door. Looking more closely, he then discovered a tiny crack running around the smooth portion of the wood, about two inches from the edge of the bark. To his astonishment, he discovered that this was a little door, just large enough for him to crawl through. He opened it, got down on his hands and knees, and crawled in. The door closed behind him with a sharp, Click clack, and he found himself standing in a flood of light, and at the edge of the same country upon which he had gazed a few moments before, when he had peered into the hole through which the bluebird had flown. He looked about him and rubbed his eyes, for he could not believe that he was really there. The first thing that he noticed was that the sun, instead of being in the western sky as it had been on the other side of the tree, appeared in the east, so that it was now morning in this land, instead of evening. He gazed about him. Everything was marvellously bright and fresh and beautiful. Then he noticed how clearly he could see. All things were more distinct, more clearly outlined than he had ever known them to be before. Where am I? he thought to himself. Someone must have heard the sound of his voice, for when he looked up, he saw a young man approaching. 
How did you get in? asked the stranger. Through the little door in the tree, answered David. How did you find the door? the stranger asked, confused. I was seeking for the blue bird that I have followed a long, long way, and he flew into a hole in the tree, and I lost him. After I had awakened from a sleep, for I was very tired, and so fell fast asleep, I tried to find the bird again, and in my searching, I found the little door. Oh, said the stranger, you followed the blue bird here, did you? Then you are welcome. You may stay here as long as you wish. That is very nice, said David, but do you mind telling me where I am? No, said the stranger, smiling. You are on the edge of the forest. What forest? asked David. The forest beyond the woodlands, answered the stranger. Oh, said David, thank you. I have heard of that forest before. There is a beautiful garden in it, is there not? I think I should like to find the garden. Can you tell me how to get to it? There is but one way, said the stranger. Follow your nose till you get there. David looked up at him in surprise, for he could not quite tell whether the stranger were making fun of him or not. I mean it, said the young man earnestly. The fragrance from the garden is so wonderfully sweet that it fills all the air round about. If you take a deep breath now, you will notice what I mean. He sniffed at the air as he spoke. David did the same. And as he did so, he noticed a quality of sweetness that he had never imagined could be in any atmosphere, save where hosts of flowers were shedding their gentle fragrance. I do see what you mean, said David. Good cried the stranger. I thought you would understand me. It truly is the only way to find the garden, just to follow your nose till you get there. It sounds queer, doesn't it? But there is lots of sense in that advice, and it is good to follow. I am sure you will get there. Good luck to you. I must go on my way now. David was now in the forest beyond the woodlands, you perceive, for he had stepped into this country when he passed through the little door that led from the other side of the great tree. In this land, things happen otherwise than in our land. Or if they do not actually happen otherwise, it seems so to those who live there. For everyone there is able to understand the inside of a thing as well as the outside. If you are able to understand only the outside of a thing, you will, more times than a few, entirely misunderstand the whole thing. But if you can understand the inside, it is not in the least necessary to bother much about the outside, for that will take care of itself. David now found himself able to understand the song of the bluebird, as he had never understood it before. 
for he could now perceive the inside of things as well as the outside. He was much surprised when he realised that, instead of its being just a bird's song, as he had always supposed, each note meant certain definite ideas and thoughts which the bluebird was expressing. For this reason, the song was never twice exactly alike. David had never noticed this before. The song had always seemed to him just the same clear, sweet musical ripple, repeating itself over and over. Now he began to detect the several notes and how varied they were in accent and arrangement, and he learned that it was within this variety of accent and arrangement that the sense of the song was to be found. Then, little by little, David caught the inner meanings of the different symbols of sound, so that, from now on, every time the bluebird sang, its song conveyed a special message to David's heart and mind.